Hey, how's it going guys? Welcome to the top 10 best movies of 2022. Now, this is obviously a format that you are not used to seeing from me because uh, I, I, it's not scripted. I, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. I don't know what I'm saying and I'm just kind of rolling with it. But you know, I like it. It's nice. But essentially because I've done videos on this in depth over the course throughout the year, I figured, you know, maybe having something like a conversational sort of back and forth between me and some random person might actually be cool to hear and you're gonna hear my thoughts on some films that maybe I haven't covered in videos before and it's uh, I don't know it's gonna be a good time the the sad sap that I had to bring on to have this conversation <laughs> with me is our beautiful editor Lawrence and he's loving life Lawrence how are you doing I'm good I, I was I was prepared to dig you out for calling me a sad sap but then you called me a beautiful man so we're, we're back on talking terms now I'm happy to be here I gotta knock you down before I bring you back up I respect that Let, let's get the fuck into this we're gonna talk about our honorable mentions i'm kind of including werewolf by night in here because like it's kind of a movie it's kind of not <laughs> it's it's also like a weird little tv special it, regardless it's the best thing the mcu has put out this year and that's like a fact it came at the exact moment where i think everyone on the planet was just like i think we're getting a bit tired of all of this and then it just did something new and refreshing and opened the doors for a director's debut that was like genuinely impressive and didn't feel like a typical marvel run-of-the-mill thing it was great it had style it had personality uh it was a lot of fun barbarian was the most shocking horror film i saw this year like what an absolute trip that was i have a video on that you guys can check out uh cha-cha real smooth which is an incredible uh film from cooper rafe who is this amazing up-and-coming director he <laughs> a lot of people have kind of been like oh he's like a young judd apatow and it's like i, I don't know if i really want to make that comparison <laughs> but like his films have like a lot of heart to them they're incredible funny very dry yeah it's on apple tv plus if, if you're gonna watch any film that's mentioned on here definitely be, make it that one because you'll most people i think will like it if they see it also bones and all timothy chalamet taylor russell luca guadagnino uh, need i say more uh that movie was fucking great something that i think will probably be on a lot of people's lists uh guillermo del toro's pinocchio a film that i loved i mean every one of guillermo del toro's films feels like a personal endeavor for him but like this one specifically really feels like, hey, this is my tribute to my parents and loss, life, grief. Incredible movie. Uh, and then uh, The Banshees of Sharon, which is the feckin' best, which is my really bad attempt at an Irish accent. I don't, have you seen this one yet? I, I saw this one, yeah. I saw this one the other night and it's just, it's fucking gut-wrenching. I saw someone compare it to the saddest episode of Father Ted. <laughs> yeah, it really is. The credits were rolling on this and I just sat there for like a full half an hour just like, oh god. Yeah, it's another one a lot of heavy movies this year i mean not that i'm like surprised or anything given the pandemic and just like all of this existential art just like spewing out yeah. of people but <laughs> it's, it's pretty heavy and then the last couple we have are pearl which i actually like more than x tar it's an interesting commentary on like cancel culture it's it's not for everyone it's slow it's a beautiful like exercise and like craft direction and uh, you know performance and it all just kind of like works together in this like insane way love tar but I, I was just like, what do I, I want to rewatch more? It's not going to be that one. And then my last honorable mention, I know I've spent like entirely too much time on this, is uh, Everything Everywhere All at Once. So uh, I'm just going to leave it at that and y'all can kill me in the comment section for that one. <laughs> so. As we reflect on the best films of 2022, in 2023, it feels safe to say that we're all looking to be our best selves. Whether you want to explore a new art or further your career, Skillshare is here to help you on your path. With the courses available on their platform, Skillshare can help you gain greater control of your career. Do you struggle with time management? Want to learn video editing? Believe me, editing for this channel, I've been there. And I've taken several great classes tailored to the specific skills that I've needed to hone in order to take this channel's content to the next level. One of my favorites is to build a creative career course curated by Skillshare, composed of lessons from more than a dozen amazing instructors. In particular, Simon Cade's seminar on how to find success as a video creator has made immeasurable difference to this channel's success on YouTube. Skillshare is offering FilmSpeak viewers the chance to explore the Skillshare class library completely free for 30 days. So why not take that opportunity to take the next step towards achieving your goals? Once the trial expires, you'll also get an additional 20% off your first year if you decide to continue. And when you see how much you can gain from Skillshare in that month, why wouldn't you want to see how much you can achieve in an entire year? Check out the link in the description below to start your free 30-day trial today. And thank you so much to Skillshare for sponsoring this video.
So let's start off with number 10, AKA Tyler's bullshit, AKA the menu, which <laughs> it was a late addition to this list. I didn't think that it was gonna make this list, but oh my God, it was amazing. I mean, if nothing else, 2022 was the year of just like the eat the rich satire. It's like watching an episode of like Chef's Table. It's done like the, the like that Netflix show and just like with with all like the beautiful music and like even the presentation and the shots and the it's it's so funny. It, it's very like witty. It's it's poking fun at like you know high culture like food culture. You know the whole idea is like I'm gonna make these like elaborate dishes and insult you to your face for paying all of this absurd money to you know eat them uh when really at the end of the day all i want to do is like flip burgers and make food that makes people happy it makes me happy because i'm making something that they're going to enjoy it's one of those ones where like you get into it and you're like what what is going on here like i'm not it, like is there like a cannibal thing in here is there just is there like a horror element uh but then as it starts to unfold it's really like this head chef played incredibly by ray fines you know kind of going through and he's like well you signed up for this specific thing i'm going to give it to you but it's not exactly what you thought and it's this you know elaborate you know multiple course meal uh where he's not only like making them come to terms with like all the bad shit they've done in their lives it's also like a, a a little bit of like a therapeutic or, or I guess like more of like a cathartic exercise for him and uh, Anya Taylor-Joy is incredible. Um, Nicholas Holt plays like the most hateable character or one of the most hateable characters of the year uh, and, and it's just really funny, really witty. Uh, it, it makes sense that this comes from one of the directors of Succession. So like if you like that kind of thing, you'll you'll like this movie. Number nine is The Northman. Such a fucking good movie, man. It is nuts. Robert Eggers takes a very simple story that we're all familiar with. It's the classic hero's journey. And then he uses that as like a gateway to explore uh, the culture of, of the Vikings and just like their mythology. The, the thing that I was left thinking about outside of just like the insane tone and mood and like brutality was Alexander Skarsgård's performance. Yeah. And it's like not only like is he just like shredded to no end, like unbelievably in, in like the best shape I've ever seen a human being be in but um you know it, it's so physically demanding uh, just in terms of like the acting because amleth is a character with very few words you see so much of what's going on in his head through his eyes through just like the, the like the pain he's going through the rage the anger it's very different for scars guard but i think it it ultimately plays to his strengths because there's so much vulnerability in his eyes and two naked dudes battling it out in a <laughs> volcano like with fucking swords are you you kidding me it doesn't get any more metal than that like that is one of the best climaxes of the year i think i think this is um because all of that stuff is incredible but i also think that like because of how like insanely fucking epic it is and the, the volcano of it all uh it, it can be easy also to overlook um like nicole kidman and anya taylor joy in this who are like yep just turning in some fucking powerhouse performances. One of one of the things that I adore about this movie, and it was actually something that I thought was the most interesting aspect, or at least um, kind of theme to, to explore, kind of was how the women in this movie almost operate the men like chess pieces to advance yep. their own kind of, not even just social standing, but kind of like chances of survival. They're basically using the like the stupidity of like, the masculine devotion to violence to advance yeah. their chances of whatever they want to do like power dynamics in this whole thing shift so often one day someone's a king one day they're a sheep farmer like it just displays how pointless male violence is and it's um kind of just like a poignant comment on toxic masculinity and like how priorities can just be so skewed because you feel like you've been wronged in some way which is just so insanely pathetic <laughs> uh, like for men to have that obsession very long-winded way of saying that yeah it's it's fucking brilliant like the moment i saw it i, I was just like god damn this thing is just like oh and i want more people to see it so if you haven't seen the northman my god what is wrong with you go see the northman Number eight is The Fablemans. This is a good fucking movie. It reaffirms why I love movies. By watching the story of like one of the greatest filmmakers ever to do it, by watching his experience and exploring like his need 
to make movies uh, as, as like a, a way to have some sort of control over his life, all of like the horrible stuff that is happening. I'm watching this and I'm like, yeah, this is why art matters. Like mm. it's, it's really hard as a creative to put yourself out there to like do stuff that is going to like tear you apart. And it's like, if you're not telling your truth as an artist, then what's the point of it all? What I loved about The Fablemans is that it really shed some light on a lot of the characters and their relationships in Spielberg's other films. Mainly, you, you know, and this has been like said to death at this point, but like mainly Richard Dreyfuss's character in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, this, this movie completely reshapes the way that we see that character and his relationship with his family. It's a film that's like, yes, spectacle is important. And funnily enough, I think spectacle is a big theme across films this year but above all else it's just sort of like why why do we need to make movies yes they can be an escape yes they're they're these fantastic event adventures but when you get to the core of it what what do you want people to feel how do you what do you want people to see it's interesting because you you've mentioned this i think this was in your video as well that like as spielberg gets older he's he's kind of becoming less interested in the big blockbuster but rather the more kind of grounded intimate pieces um, yeah, that I think yeah. he is drawing from life experiences. I mean, definitely in this one, obviously. It's interesting because, like, as an audience member, it's, yeah, the blockbusters are one thing and they're incredible to see, but you forget that when a personal piece like this is done with the skill that Spielberg possesses, it's such a cut above the rest. Like, from the very first yeah, few, yeah. like, shots of this, I mean, from the very first shot of this, it's so deliberate and thoughtful the way the camera is like panning and showing the disconnect between his parents as they talk to him outside the theater like it's just it, it it's it's so intentional and so it basically a shot that could have been so boring in spielberg's hands is a reminder of why these great directors should aspire to make more kind of intimate pieces instead of just kind of clawing for the next big hit if you've ever watched a movie and you've ever felt uh you know transported or moved or, or or just like emotionally affected in any way this movie really gets to the core of why that happens and why that's important okay number seven and it killed me to put it this low is elvis a film that i fucking love from the moment <laughs> i saw but i don't think you're as crazy about it are you it's it's not that i'm not as crazy about it like everyone has a relationship with baz Luhrmann. I think and it's 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 typically like a love it or you hate it kind of situation this I found I found the pacing a bit confusing to say the least I feel like it slowed down in the parts I wanted to brush over and kind of sped back up again at the parts I wanted to take more time with but I think overall like it, it would still make my top 10 list as well um because this is just a masterclass in casting it's it's Baz Luhrmann as Baz Luhrmann as he's ever been, aside from maybe Moulin Rouge, it takes a real kind of inherent talent for directing to be able to take iconic and well-known music like the fucking discography of Elvis uh, and then pair it with Elvis's story, which, you know, kind of is a lot more tragic and somber. Um, and, and how it's able to toe the line between glamour and despair is just like kind of a really beautiful and moving thing and I think Austin Butler just fucking crushes it out of the park and it's and the, the movie is worth the price of admission for uh, Tom Hanks's he's white line which is just uh, yeah. which is just fantastic <laughs> yeah I know the way that he told this story isn't gonna be for everyone people are just like well why the fuck did you tell this through the lens of the colonel and I think <laughs> it's because of, uh, it's because of how mythologized Elvis has been right he's kind of getting to the root of of why that is the case, right? You, so you've got this you've got this antagonist who's going to be like, "Oh, you think I killed Elvis? Well, let me refute that to you and and tell you like what really how, you know, for his side of the story and everything like that." So you, you can kind of understand like th the consumerist parts of, of like Elvis's entire existence and, and all that stuff. He uses the 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 idea of Elvis to explore larger themes of America in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's another film that deals with spectacle uh spectacle versus the human element of art right like what like the the consumption of of something grand and I, I guess as the colonel puts it like a carnival act that he can sell and then like the soul which is also a fundamentally american idea like the, the plea for like a better world and like universality and, and like uniting people and it's like elvis is trying to do that through art right but he's also kind of like held back by like the media the colonel whoever kind of projecting these 
labels onto him. And so it's like this battle for like the artist to to like break through and like you see that that conflict and that friction throughout the film and uh it, it is like a great american tragedy so coming in at number six is avatar the way of water uh a film that is well god what is it like 13 years in the making or, or so something along those lines is it 13 years too late no absolutely not like it's one of those movies like three hours long and i never felt the length i just wanted to be in this world and, and like exploring the ocean in there seeing like the the Tolkien the whales the, the relationship they have with the um the reef people there and then on top of that all on top of just like this incredible just visual sensory experience you have a very beautiful story about parents and their children and like these kids just like wanting to be accepted wanting to find themselves and like the whole concept of avatar is like i see you right and these kids just all they want is for their parents to see them for who they are it's a very heartfelt and compassionate blockbuster that like the the action in this film i think what i love about james cameron is like when he does a sequel he's like okay so we've already done the original film and we've gone as big as we can go we've done the most like epic action-packed climax ever so what are we gonna do in a sequel? Okay, we're gonna go deeper. We're still gonna give you the same spectacle that you loved about that original film, but we're gonna tackle it from a more intimate point of view. So like by the time you get to the climax in Avatar The Way of Water, you're just like, oh my God, I didn't realize I cared so much for these characters. It's it's edge of your seat stuff. The main thing for this for me is it's such a fucking like technical undertaking. To even pull this off is such a tremendous achievement. Like you've got, you've got fucking, a regular sized human dude character in Spider who is like interacting with the enlarged actors playing the Na'vi in a completely CG environment to manage it all and then to be the director with the, like, the fucking just brass balls to be like, I'm gonna have him play fight pretty much every time they're on screen. Like, you're just, <laughs> he's a madman to be able to, like, one, conceptualize this and two, pull it off in an effective way. Like, while watching this, you can clearly see why it takes 13 years to fucking make them because they're just, they're on a different level. The, the last thing I'll say about Avatar, I would like your audience to see the first thing I texted you after I got out of my screening for Avatars, which I'm gonna put that message on the screen now. <laughs> Fucking spider, dude. Coming in at number five is probably the one that's gonna be at number one for like 90% of the people. And that is Top Gun Maverick. It had like a very broad effect on people. Like it was just such a, a big part of the cultural zeitgeist. And you're, you know, you, you're, you'd be hard pressed to meet someone who hasn't seen this movie, who, who doesn't love this movie. I certainly don't have like the love for Tom Cruise that some other people do. It's one of those things where it's like, I respect his, the hell out of him as like an actor, as a performer as someone who is constantly putting the audience first in his films. Uh, every fucking video on the planet is going to be like, wow, wow, pandemic and return to the theaters. But it is that. Do you know what I mean? Like this movie in a different climate maybe might not have hit as hard, but because it's yeah. the amount of movie that it is fucking pioneered by a brilliant director who does make fucking banger films, whether you want to... Let's fucking talk... This, this is going to be the Joseph Kaczynski just like worship section right here because Joseph Kaczynski has never made a bad film. I will say, more than any other film he's done lately, it does feel like the most introspective. Like, yes, we're talking about, like, an aging maverick who's, like, trying to figure out his place in a world that is becoming increasingly more automated, and he's clinging to analog, and it's like, yes, that's a very, you know, a lot of people can relate to that, especially as it pertains to movie making. I think that's kind of the thing where that, that really hooked me about this, is, is it feels like, oh, this is why Tom Cruise does what he does. Tom Cruise has just like an insatiable desire to entertain an audience at like the expense of his own life. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you know, and this movie kind of just like gets to the root of that. It's sort of like he doesn't know how else to do it. They're in these cockpits for real. They're going through the G's and just like the intense maneuvers and like especially when Tom Cruise is doing that like final or not not the trench run part, but like the the test trench run, right? Right? With, yeah. <laughs> what I call it, I call it the Buzz Lightyear sequence because it's like basically the entire elaborate thing in Toy Story where Buzz Lightyear like goes through all like the hoops and he like bounces on the ball and he swings through like the fan. He's like, can. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, that is the, that like, 
that is Tom Cruise's Buzz Lightyear moment, and like, I'll give it to him. It's like one of the few legacy sequels that actually has something to say about legacy and its relationship with the present and the future. Uh, you know, it's examining risk-taking, ambition, and inspiring a new generation to believe in the impossible. You know, no pun intended. It's it's a crowd pleaser. It's a banger. Like it's so accessible, and like the fact that a Top Gun fucking sequel is that accessible is ridiculous. Number four is no. The, the different ways that he tackled the the concept of of spectacle and just like at the expense of like the identity and culture and people uh in in like marginalized groups specifically within uh you know the black community and just like representing that through this massive alien that is just like a a, a a giant vacuum that just consumes everything like it's just it is it is the movie that i've probably spent the most time thinking about this year and the one that i've been dying to rewatch more than i have this is why we go to the movies like yes there is thoughtfulness to it peel is obviously making some very profound commentary on like you know minorities or, or, or black um people in entertainment and uh you know, all of that is effective. The idea of basically uh, pushing something to the extreme until they they lash back, right? Like which which we we see with with Gordy among other things. But at the same time, it's it does what Jaws did, which was that it's just exciting big screen popcorn entertainment. I think you hit the nail on the head um, with the the confidence that Jordan Peele shows in this one, because I think there's so many kind of interesting discussions to be had about this, like you know surrounding like upholding legacies, like forging new ones. There's, there's so many interesting kind of metaphors with um, OJ and Emerald and how they were brought yep. up. It, the, the, just, the, just the incredible framing piece of OJ recommitting his life and that being visually referenced as he is the lone black man on the horse um, at the end of the movie, even surrounded by the frame, which was a doorway to the like the thing. Yeah, dude, that was like one of my favorite shots of the, the entire film is basically when they like recreate the image. What, what I what I need to see more of is just this level of tight editing and tight script work because when you pair it with a director that knows what the fuck he's doing and has this unique singular vision and is is so steadfast in what he what he's able to communicate uh, it's just yeah it's it's a brilliant work I genuinely think this is his best film and I think it's going to be so hard for anyone to top this especially when it comes to exploring similar themes coming in to the top three number three is Glass Onion. This is one of my favorite scripts of the year. Glass Onion is, <laughs> it's like an anti-joke. And I hate anti-jokes. <laughs> but it's like, in this instance, it's like, no, that's that's really fucking funny because it's something that like is just, it rings so true with a, a you know, a lot of these big public figures in, in society today, whether it's like the tech billionaires or like the politicians, you know, the, the fucking Joe Rogans of the, the world and, and everything, Andrew Tate's and all that. Like there is, there are all these, they're all like connected in, in some sort of ways. There is this like incestuous sort of relationship. It's like, oh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours and whatever. And you've got like the, the Elon Musk kind of, you know, Mark Zuckerberg figurehead that's like kind of like the one that's like kind of manipulating everything because he doesn't have to like abide by you know a, a rule book or or yeah. whatever you, if he you know, gets in trouble he's just got unlimited wealth to deal with it and like, yeah almost yeah. immunity to the law which like i i like the fact that the movie got to a point where it was like yeah that's that's unfortunately reality that's that's the way it is and it's not like it's like it's wrong but we as law-abiding citizens can't really do anything about it even though we know he's literally gaslighting every single person in this room or whoever like i like how like before the final act and, and, and like the sweet victory happens they're like mm, nine times out of ten this is where the story ends and that's the fucked up nature of it all probably my favorite part of the entire movie was like the reveal uh and it wasn't necessarily like a reveal but it's it really speaks to the fact that sometimes when you're listening to people you don't necessarily process the words they're saying, right? <laughs> the whole like embreviate thing. Oh my fucking god! I don't. I, I that was so funny. I laughed. Yeah. I laughed so hard at that because I was like, he's got to know what he's talking about. 
about, right? Like, he's a, he's a billionaire. He's, he's made a bunch of money, like, blah, 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 whatever. Like everyone else who just kind of assumes that he's a genius because of everything that he's done. You don't have to be a genius to be this successful. A lot of the times, people just get here by sheer dumb luck or just by being yeah, opportunistic. Just, just completely fucking exploiting everyone on the way to the top, stealing ideas yep, um, yep. from people that are actually fucking creative. I love that fucking, um, just, just that line from Daniel Craig about, oh, when Kate Hudson's like, oh, it's so dumb, it's genius. And he's like, no, yeah. it's just dumb. Like, yeah, because... It's not genius, it's dumb. Because <laughs> we always, we always want to give these people too much credit, right? We want to be like, oh, well, it's dumb, but, like, it's, it's because he's, like, subverting this. Like, don't you see what's getting... And it's like, no, 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 just, just call a spade a spade, right? Like, it, yeah. it, it's very simple, it's straightforward. All right, now we're on to number two. We're getting close here. The Batman aka the best comic book movie of the year by like 5000 miles like I, I like nothing <laughs> even really came close to topping this it's not your typical superhero thing and i think hiring a man like matt reeves is very kind of um, it speaks to that uh, because it's such a, a an intimate story in terms of this isn't about what batman's doing this is about what bruce perceives batman is doing the, the effect that that's having on him, the effect that his life up until this point has had on him um, in terms of being grief-stricken, guilt-ridden. Just a very, very interesting way to approach Batman and, and leans away from what previous Batmans have um, in that they explore it to an extent, but never never at expense of the villain and the plot and the, and the, yeah. and the main thing. Whereas this entire movie is about what the fuck is this guy doing? <laughs> it feels <laughs> you know like a movie that like is not only only just like an incredible Batman story about like him learning that he can't just be beating the shit out of people and like perpetuating a cycle of violence because he's just gonna inspire wackos that are going to interpret his message the wrong way and do something like even worse. He, he has to discover that he is part of the problem and then fix that. He can't be vengeance, he has to be a hero. And I think that is a really powerful way of tackling a young Batman who is just like so furious at, at what's happened to him, but he's and he's lashing out, but he's not really doing much about it. He's just kind of like raging against whoever fucking walks in front of him, not necessarily directing his anger and frustration at the problem. He, he, he's not a solution uh, and he's not propping up people who could be a solution such as the mayor until the end of the film. Bruce sees things in such a, a black and white kind of way um, that if you're not part of the solution then you're part of the problem. I think the most interesting aspect of this movie is the relationship he has uh, with Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman. She, she is necessary for his growth because she is on the wrong side of the law. She is quote unquote a criminal someone that the first time we see batman he probably th he probably wouldn't think twice about fucking kicking the shit out of her and and he needs to learn and realize that oh hang on a minute the system is so fucking obscenely corrupt and unfair and unevenly weighted that it's impossible for some people to live without breaking laws and you know he comes to realize he's 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 being hypocritical yeah. what he's doing is not legal and yet the money that he has and and the sense of entitlement he feels because he feels he's owed some sort of justice from the world is exactly the same as what other people do they're just not afforded the same resources yeah like yeah that that that's def that was definitely important for this but like okay going forward how are you going to like how are you going to manage this balancing act how are you going to uh, uh, you know, uh, explore the duality of, of Bruce Wayne and Batman. Uh, that that's what I'm really excited to see because every time every time Pattinson is like Bruce Wayne in public, he's like really reserved, uh, shy. He almost doesn't know how to be a person. Um, yeah. Which I yeah. which which I think is just like again like it's like the only film to like completely understand that this guy is just like. Like, yeah, we all love Batman. We all think of Batman as being like, I, I don't, I don't know, American James Bond or whatever. But it's like, no, this guy's like fucking damaged, right? Like he's got yeah. some like, serious psychological trauma that he needs to uh, unpack. The number one movie of 2022, Damien Chazelle's insane epic Babylon. I, I've you know spoken ad nauseum about my love for this movie. I mean, it is just like an insane odyssey through the twilight of the silent era, and it, it's outrageous. An elephant's asshole opens up, and shit just pours out of it onto the main character and like the guy next to him. Really effective at painting a portrait 
of of like what's going down in this film and like the shit one has to endure to make it in this industry. And then also the fact that like even after you endure all that shit, that doesn't mean it's going to last. Like it's it's a it's a challenge every fucking day to fight for your life in this this ruthless just like soul-sucking industry. I think it's another movie that kind of, you know, explores the idea of of spectacle as we sort of talked about been the common theme through 2022 movies. Uh where it's sort of like, you know, it amidst the chaos, the debauchery, the just like the mayhem and like the mistreatment of, of people, the exploitation of uh, marginalized people uh, amidst a sea of absolute chaos. We get these incredible moments of humanity. When when the camera's rolling and you get that perfect shot, those little moments that make movies magical, the fact that those can come out of the most just like fucking insane and like, you know, at times frustrating industry is a miracle. Like that, that is the miracle of movie making. Damien Chazelle kind of explores that idea uh, and, and like every time I talk about this movie with people I'm like it's a movie that loves the art of movie making but it detests the industry and the culture as a whole and it's one of those things where it's like he's constantly at awe with how we're able to get the, the films that we do amidst the madness that kind of uh, go on. Uh, Margot Robbie gives like I would probably say the best performance of her career. I think Brad Pitt in a similar-ish role role to the Leo DiCaprio role in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and yet I feel like he does it with so much more nuance in this film. Like it feels real. It feels like someone who who used to be famous, who used to be popular, who used to be beloved who's really struggling to find a place amidst like an industry that's going through such like a tectonic shift. Uh, more cynical than than La La Land, uh, it, it kind of like goes through the idea that like everything's like a remix, like true original originality is like kind of hard to come by, like all the great stories, all the great pieces of art have already kind of been done before, so it's up to the artists, the voices to, you know, bring their own personal experiences into it, which is why representation and like, you know, stuff like that is is very important because that's how we tell the same stories from new angles and that that's how things change in in the industry and, and so it's it's um in a lot of ways I, I think it's it's a perfect contrast to La La Land um definitely less glamorous but like equally as as compelling uh it, it feels like the definitive Hollywood epic of our time it, it's like very honest about the whole thing uh the the exploitation the discardment of of people who used to be stars throwing them away pumping them full of you know hopes and and drugs and just like excess and and then like being like oh well you know this is kind of out of style now so we're gonna you know move on from you like it's just a it's a very ruthless industry and um this is a film that's like bound to become a cult classic in the near future i i i am like confident of it it's absurd in all the best ways and so i guess that's why it is my favorite movie of 2022 Thank you.